The health and economic crises arising from the pandemic have created tremendous challenges for Americans living in poverty and for legal aid programs and for America's courts. We are fortunate today to be joined by four leaders in our state courts in addressing these challenges. Chief Justice Tani Kantil Sakui is the first Asian, Filipina, American, and second woman to serve as Chief Justice of the state of California. Was awarded the 2019 Sandra Day O'Connor Award by the National Center for State Courts for her work in promoting civic education. Chief, where are you joining us from today? Hi, Ron. I'm joining you from California and my enthusiasm and admiration for your work with LSC knows no bounds. I am thrilled with your passion. I enjoyed listening to our Congress members talk about their experience. Uh, I also feel renewed in my enthusiasm based on the partnerships you've described. Thank you, Ron. Chief Justice Nathan Heck has served on the Supreme Court of Texas since 1988. He is the longest serving member of the court in Texas history and the senior Texas appellate judge in active service. He is also, fortunately for all of us, the president of the National Conference of Chief Justices. Chief Justice Heck, where are you today? Thanks, Ron. Happy to join you. I'm uh, in Austin. We're not even going to get up in the uh, mid 80s yet uh, today. So, uh, uh, it's a far cry from what our friends on the East Coast and Chicago and elsewhere are uh, uh, facing, but I'm delighted to join you. In addition to your experience and wisdom, you could share about you know 20 or 30 degrees with those of us on the uh, East Coast. <laughs> Chief Justice Bridget McCormick joined the Michigan Supreme Court in 2013 and became Chief Justice in 2019. Before her election to the court, she was a law professor and Dean at the University of Michigan Law School. Since joining the court, Chief Justice McCormick continues to teach at the law school. Chief, where are you joining us from today? Great to be here, great to see all my friends and to see you, Ron. I am joining you from my uh, home office, also known as my living room in Ann Arbor, Michigan, go blue. I must say, Chief Justice uh, Kantil Sakui, uh, Hecht and uh, McCormick are repeat uh, 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 offenders? Um, yeah, well, I, was, I, wa I wanted to come up with a word other than offenders, but they've joined us on multiple occasions. In fact, uh, I think uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, Hecht and McCormick are probably due gold watches or something at this point for the number of appearances they've made. We're also joined today in our what was supposed to be our Nevada uh, meeting by Justice Christina Pickering. Justice Pickering was elected to serve on the Nevada Supreme Court in 2008. Significantly, Justice Pickering serves as co-chair of the Nevada Access to Justice Commission and in 2014 received the Legal Aid Center of S Southern Nevada Pro Bono Project Award of Judicial Excellence. Justice Pickering, where are you today? We, we, we were intending to be with you in Nevada. Thank you very much. I'm here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it is such a distinct privilege to be a participant in today's proceedings. Thank you so much. Well, Justice Pickering, tell us, how has the pandemic affected access to justice in Nevada? And uh, how has it affected the state courts? And what steps have the courts and uh, your Access to Justice Commission taken to address the barriers created by the pandemic? Five minutes is probably not adequate to that. So I'm going to narrow the focus on um, what happened here and give you an overview. But later today, you'll be joined by Brad Lewis, who's the head of the, 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 the hands-on Access to Justice Commission here in Nevada, and he'll provide additional details of what I'm talking about. Nevada's courts, like courts across the country, were in-person um, uh, operation until March 12th, when our governor entered an order de uh, declaring Nevada a state of emergency and everything was closed. The casinos in Las Vegas were shuttered. That is the dominant um, employer in the state of Nevada. We are primarily a tourist-based economy that had an immediate and profound impact on Nevada's citizens and Nevada's courts. But within a week, 
each of the different district courts in Nevada had in place um, administrative orders that closed the courts either entirely to in-person access in one instance or to all but essential business. And the task of defining what is essential business is a profound one, particularly when the pandemic is putting people out of work who are cut, who, who live paycheck to paycheck, but have lived well on that, on that setup. Um, it was an immediate issue with respect to uh, eviction cases. In 2019, the Las Vegas Justice Court alone handled 30,000 eviction cases. Those numbers, once the stay of evictions would be lifted, nobody knew what they were, but the estimates ranged well into six figures. Um, the courts did have an eviction moratorium due to Governor Sisolak's emergency directive, but that moratorium had an end date of where it was due to expire, um, and that end date kept moving. And the way in which the courts here responded to that, and I'd like to focus on the Las Vegas Justice Court here, um, they really did a superb job. But picture this, all of the courts, the trial courts in Nevada, in Las Vegas, for Clark County are in one building with a few exceptions. So we have our municipal court, our justice courts, and our district courts, which are our trial courts. So trying to integrate who can come in and who can do what in that court setting was a very tall order for the judges involved in those courts, as well as for me as then Chief Justice of the Nevada Supreme Court. Um, what we did in terms of trying to focus on the eviction issue was look first at how are these eviction cases filed and how will tenants get information when the, more, the uh, stay that the governor imposed lifts. Secondly, what can we do to address these issues? And Nevada has an anomalous um, statutory scheme for evictions. The, the landlord doesn't file the case. The case is commenced by the landlord serving the tenant with a notice to quit, which happens outside the court system. The case is started when the tenant files the answer. And yes, Nevada Justice Court had e-filing, but those of us on the Access to Justice Commission who tried to e-file an answer experimentally found that it was so laborious and complex, we couldn't do it. I'm sure some of the millennials could do it readily, but for normal people trying to engage and get the benefit of whatever programs were in place, we had to simplify the e-filing system to guide to, to create a guide and file system where tenants could address screens and fill in information and be prompted as they walk through. Otherwise, we would have all the tenants coming to the courthouse in downtown Las Vegas, and it would be a true Petri dish. So it's a public health issue as well as an access to justice issue. Um, so we got that on board and it was successful, but it took an enormous amount of work and it was thanks to the Justice Court and that team that got that done. We also stood up a mediation program trying to match tenants and landlords with the available federal funding for rental assistance. Um, Brad Lewis will go into that in greater, greater detail, but it took an amendment to Nevada's statutory procedure to even have that proceed. And it was part of the special session that the legislature convened in Nevada last summer that they would they allow a 30 day stay while parties are directed to mediation. I could go on, but I don't want to exceed my time limit. Um, but this is just a sketch of the kind of thing that we've been confronting here in Nevada. And I will add just in closing that the rural courts in Nevada, as well as the urban courts, the rural courts face their own truly unique challenges. Some of them do not have e-filing. Um, some of them do not have facilities that are readily adaptable to a reopened virtual environment. And that has been a tremendous challenge for rural courts across Nevada as well. Thank you though. I think your remarks underscore how forward looking creative and innovative the courts must be in responding to these challenges, all while being operating under existing laws and uh, uh, regulations, and obviously within state budgets and uh, physical uh, 
uh, constraints. So it's uh, like a 12-sided Rubik cube. Um, yes, the, the, the motif that people said over and over again is we are inventing the airplane while we're flying it. The next pilot we're turning to uh, in this enterprise is uh, Chief Justice McCormick. Uh, uh, Chief, tell us what challenges the pandemic has presented uh, in Michigan and how the courts in particular have used uh, technology uh, to try to uh, keep the, the plane afloat while it's uh, while you're still flying. Yeah, that, I, I think the challenges in Michigan were, were the challenges that everyone faced. I mean, we all had to figure out how to keep people safe. Um, courthouses are dense places where people interact with people they don't know. They are not COVID pods. They're not safe COVID pods. Um, so we had to figure out how to keep people safe and also uh, make sure people could continue to access justice and we had to do it quickly. Detroit was one of the first early places where we had extremely high numbers. So we had we had to quickly move to figure out what to do. We were lucky in Michigan. We had a lot of things already in place that allowed us to move quickly. Every judge in the state already had a Zoom license. They had them for a year. That doesn't mean they were using them, but we, um, we had gotten them uh, long before we saw a pandemic coming. We just thought it was a way to figure out how to do some things more efficiently, more effectively, more transparently. They also all had the hardware to be able to move to remote platforms. So we were quickly able to stand up a rapid response task force to get the judges trained, get them the tech tools they needed to make sure that they could um, quickly move their uh, work to the Zoom platform. And we chose the YouTube platform to, to um, uh, as a way for the public to see what was going on. That part was like some somewhat easy. I'm, 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 I'm lucky to be able to say in Michigan. But at the same time, we had to figure out lots of other ways to um, make sure people could get their legal problems resolved. So we had an online dispute resolution platform operating in 17 of Michigan's 83 counties because it was new. It was a nascent system. It was going to take us another year and a half to put it in 83 counties. We did it in two months instead. So by July 1st, we had statewide online dispute resolution absolutely free with or without a mediator. Anybody can use it. 83 counties statewide. Um, we put the entire state in an eviction diversion program. We got the legislature to give us a significant amount of CARES money, not just for um, resolving disputes, but also for legal aid lawyers who we needed a lot more of them since every single case was going to be forced into diversion with the mediator on the Zoom platform. Um, and we did that in July and it went um, incredibly well. And we encouraged innovation um, in a way that I think uh, none of us are normally good at. And so we've seen unbelievably, I think, um, wonderful ideas pop up around the state as a result of all of this change. You know, we've seen more change in the last 10 months than we've seen in a um, uh, uh, hundred years, no, no doubt. And, and the result of that is people are feeling like, oh, I got an idea. I'm just going to see how it works. So I have a judge in Ann Arbor who regularly has a police officer she works with who takes his cell phone to the local homeless shelter and a park where a number of homeless people regularly convene and they clear warrants on his phone. Um, uh, and they zoom into her courtroom, they clear warrants, people get instructions about what they need to do next and they're clearing dockets by taking the court to the people. We have a judge in um, Lansing who decided that they needed a virtual help desk because a lot of people seem to be more comfortable on the Zoom platform showing up and asking questions and figuring out how to do things. So they took an extra Zoom room, they made it a Zoom help desk. And you can show up, I, I went recently just to watch what happens and people show up in the in the Zoom help desk and, and they get to talk to a real person and see them and the clerk shows them what they have to do to figure out how to solve their problem. They look things up for them right while they're there in the Zoom help room and um, it's a wonderful way to provide service to the public. Um, at the same time, our Justice for All Commission was um, sort of about a year into its work or not quite 10 months into its work. And uh, we were able to accelerate its work as a result of the pandemic. The Jail and Pretrial Task Force was about a year and two months into its work. We were able to accelerate its work um, as well. And we have, as a result, seen such tremendous change to the front end of our criminal legal system, the very back end of our criminal legal system, and our civil justice system as a result of what has obviously been a terrible disruption and a terrible tragedy. Um, I have said it a million times, I believe that this is the opportunity for us to finally make disruptive change in our access to justice gap. And we've seen it, and um, we can talk later about next steps. I'm eager to hear from my other colleagues. Chief Justice Hecht, I'm, I'm going to you know, violate sort of a fundamental trial lawyer's uh, uh, principle by asking you a compound question. Uh, 
Part one, technology, as uh, Chief Justice McCormick just described, has played a significant role in promoting access to justice during the pandemic. But not everybody has uh, good access to technology or to the internet. The digital divide caused by geography and poverty impairs the ability of many people to access technology and the internet. I know Texas has taken some proactive steps to address that. So part one of my uh, compound question is to ask you about that and evictions. Evictions is, uh, if not the most prominent uh, civil legal problem uh, these days, it's uh, gotta be close to the top. And again, I think Texas and uh, your court have uh, taken some very uh, proactive uh, steps to deal with those. So if you could address both those, I'd appreciate it. Well, we, um, we didn't get uh, Zoom licenses a year ahead, but we got them about uh, a week ahead. Our first uh, COVID case was on March 4th uh, down south of Houston. Uh, and of course it exploded after that. Um, we issued, an, our court has emergency powers so we can suspend um, deadlines and procedures in court proceedings uh, or adjust them as we need to. And we did that and then um, that was on March 13th, the same day the president declared a national emergency. Our governor declared a state emergency, uh, and we uh, a lot of the courthouses closed for several days, but uh, they got back up and running uh, pretty quickly. Um, the um, uh, uh, we had Zoom licenses. We tried to teach judges how to use them. They they caught on pretty quickly. Um, the uh, I asked the legal aid providers in Texas uh, to think specifically about their uh, access to clients and being able to handle their needs uh, in the circumstances. <clears throat> and they've really done a lot. Um, they've uh, provided equipment uh, to some of their clients. They've provided access to their equipment by making spaces uh, in their offices for clients to use. Uh, to have uh, court hearings. Um, they've uh, gotten spaces in schools and libraries often when they were closed uh, to do the same thing. Uh, they've loaned clients computers and hotspots uh, to try to facilitate uh, communication. Um, it, they were One provider was really proud <clears throat> that um, they had a bedridden elder uh, who needed to go to a virtual hearing uh, and they just took the technology he needed to his bedside uh, and helped him uh, attend the meeting uh, from bed. Um, but there, that just shows the passion and the innovation uh, that they want to bring to the challenges uh, that are affecting them. Um, they've done a lot of um, uh, intakes by phone. They're trying to train their clients on how to use phones when they don't have uh, laptops or uh, Wi-Fi or other computers uh, and get uh, broadband access uh, for them. We've started, they started a rules, uh, Wills Clinic in Houston, then they started another one in San Antonio. Uh, I don't know how it is uh, on this particular subject in other states, but our probate cases have gone way up uh, during the uh, uh, pandemic. Um, so, um, we uh, have noticed one uh, remarkable thing here in Texas, but it's also uh, true across the country, as I know from uh, being president of the Chief Justices this year, and that is um, while we're working hard to narrow the um, uh, digital divide, we are narrowing uh, the access divide. Uh, so because of the uh, remote hearings and the access to technology by the participants, there's been a significant increase in participation um, because uh, transportation barriers, uh, work, uh, child care, and frankly, I think intimidation um, are just way down when you're accessing court proceedings remotely. Um, so that's made a big difference too. On evictions, <clears throat> because the court has um, emergency authority, we imposed a statewide uh, moratorium for two months right off the bat. But K Texas has 254 counties um, and Brewster County out by El Paso is bigger than Connecticut. Um, it only has 10,000 people and uh, 
uh, tell people that uh, if, Connect if New Haven had the population density of Brewster County, it would have a population of 12. Um, the, um, I, I, I agree that there are a lot of challenges in the rural areas, um, but also the pandemic hits very differently uh, in rural and uh, urban areas. So we decided, the court decided uh, pretty early on after the two months that we really needed to um, take the take away the statewide moratorium and let judges begin to work through their caseloads themselves. And they've done really well. We got them uh, a working group of stakeholders. It's very important, I think, in these processes to reach out to both sides of the docket. So uh, we have uh, landlords, lawyers, and representatives uh, in the working group. Uh, a lot of them are struggling too. Um, and so uh, solutions need to keep them in mind. Um, like Michigan, we have a, an eviction diversion program. Uh, it's about $171 million that uh, Governor Abbott gave us. Um, and um, the, uh, it, it, we've had, it's been going through some pilot projects, but it's expanding uh, daily uh, and it's uh, helping a lot in uh, both helping both tenants and landlords in uh, meeting these uh, struggles that the, that the pandemic has uh, forced onto them. I know legal aid providers are uh, hiring a bunch of temporary lawyers. Uh, they've established an evictions assistance coalition in Houston to make sure that uh, eligible clients uh, have lawyers. Some of these, you know, so many people just don't even know uh, that help is uh, available. Um, and um, uh, the eviction cases are actually down quite a bit in Texas during the pandemic. The pandemic. They're down about 62% uh, here. Um, but we have every anticipation that uh, they're going to be back up and there'll be a significant backlog. And then last but not least, certainly not least, uh, we have continued to make sure the funding is strong. Um, the eviction diversion program included $4 million for legal aid uh, providers in Texas. And that was at the direct designation of the governor. Um, and uh, we would not be able to, to, we wouldn't be the recipient of that kind of funding uh, for legal aid if uh, state leadership, um, which in our state is pretty conservative, uh, weren't convinced uh, that legal aid was helping the economy and the, and the uh, communities at large. And um, we put our money where our mouth is. We, uh, our court was required to submit a budget um, last fall uh, for the coming year. And they asked, the, the budget writers asked us to cut 5% out of our budget. Well, my colleagues can appreciate that the, <laughs> we don't have 5% fluff in our budgets. You, you can't cut money like that without cutting people. Uh, or in our budget, uh, all of the legal aid money is in our budget. So we could have taken an easy cut of 5% out of the legal aid money. And I just didn't think we could go across the street with a straight face and say legal, legal aid really needed our help if the first thing we did was cut them uh, when we needed to cut. So we cut our law clerk pro program instead. Uh, and we just made up our minds. We just do the best we can. Um, uh, when the happy ending is that the budget writer said, Oh, we were just funding you. You don't have to cut 5% after all. Uh, and so we were a little, a little relieved. But the good news is uh, all of that legal aid funding remains intact. And we've asked for more to get us through the uh, pandemic. So we're doing our very best to try to uh, meet these historic challenges. Thanks, Chief. Justice Cantil Sakui, what are you seeing in California? What, uh, what steps has the state and uh, your courts taken to meet the surge in uh, access to justice needs and civil legal needs. Thank you, Ron. Well, I concur in all that my chief colleagues have said. Uh, we are all potentially in, in the same boat and uh, we are probably only different in terms of scale and size, but those are the same solutions. It is uh, quickly pivot to remote, accelerate programs, reach out to our partners on both sides of the aisle, trying to meet needs and also uh, trying to meet dire needs, creating uh, efficiencies so we can create room for civil, particularly efficiencies in criminal to make room for a civil. 
all, like my colleagues, all of our courts have stayed open. If they closed for any period of time, it was brief in order to come up to speed on technology. Every court in California is remotely operating probably 90% of its caseload, but there are just some things that have to be in person. And we're a little bit different because in March when 2020, when the pandemic hit, our legislature went out of session. So the only two functioning branches of government at that time was the executive branch and the judicial branch. And we were both getting the same demands understandably from the most vulnerable, uh, from the civil bar and from the defense bar. And we, I like uh, Chief Justice Hecht, have a fair amount of emergency powers that are entrusted to the Chief Justice uh, and Chair of the Judicial Council. Only they weren't enough, frankly, and they aren't statewide particularly, they're by county or emergency. And so uh, the governor early on unprecedented uh, tendered to me as the chair of the Judicial Council as Chief Justice, broad powers under an executive order to essentially stay and suspend any law that in any way hindered our ability to keep our workers, our fa court family, and the public safe. Now this was sort of a double-edged sword kind of gift because there was a heat transfer all of the attorneys and the interest groups that had been across the street now trained their eyes on the Judicial Council and we received every kind of possible demand. Um, so at that point, with that authority, we did just like my colleagues, we closed unlawful detainer courts for the exact reasons, to shelter in place, to do our part to flatten the curve, like uh, Chief Justice Pickering said, it, unlawful detainer courts or any mass court is a petri dish. We didn't want to be the source of a super spreader outbreak. Uh, we received praise from tenants. We were pilloried by the landlords. But I'm sure my colleagues will say for every request as to how the court should operate in pandemic, we received the exact opposite request from another party. And so we tried to be as transparent and balanced. And like my colleagues, we reached across to both sides, plaintiff's bar, uh, defense bar. I said to them, you go figure out what you can agree to and only bring to me what you cannot. And to that, like everyone else, we changed our rules to remote practice. So much of our remote practice is works fine for attorneys. It's where we break down is, is pro se, pro per legal aid, and we're trying to remedy and find a way to make that more uniform, easier, accessible. Our legislature, when they did come back into session, immediately turned to the tasks at hand. Our budget in this current fiscal year recognized that we needed more money. So they gave us about 25 million for modernization, which barely scratches the surface of the need. Uh, they gave us 50 million for backlog which I'm sure my colleagues will tell you doesn't even begin to touch the backlog that all of us will be facing because of our more limited ways of operating. Uh, we cannot hold, we're still holding jury trials, but like my colleagues, we're holding a court of 20 stories can only do five because we have to spread jurors. By the way, jurors aren't showing up to the summons. Uh, it takes longer and more to call. Uh, we have to interrupt trials because someone is exposed. So there's a whole fits of starts and stops. But I think the bottom line to know is we are continuing to trudge ahead as difficult <clears throat> as it is. And the interesting aspect about the eviction moratorium is I, we were trying to lift it as soon as possible, recognizing that that eviction issue is really something that the other two branches of government should address because they can bring in more parties and more interest and have a more balanced dialogue about a solution of the tsunami of evictions. And yet they had difficulty. And I think it's like my colleague said earlier, the legislature and the governor came to us and said, please extend your moratorium. While landlords were saying, don't you dare extend that moratorium. And so we were in a push pull, but we extended the moratorium on evictions just long enough for the legislature to pass some shelter laws, 
that basically changed unlawful detainer and, and mortgage judicial foreclosure. And they continue now to refine those laws to protect people in terms of finding better protections for eviction as the COVID pandemic rages on. We've really tried to be innovative. I think uh, both Chief Justice uh, uh, Hecht and also McCormick mentioned, we have just judges who are trying anything and making it work and reporting back that this works and we're trying to spread the idea. We've, we're we're, we're uh, innovative, we're resilient. We'll try anything to let justice have its day. Thank you, and, and that's really a perfect segue to my last question for all of you. Uh, we've heard about a lot of creativity, innovations, a willingness to try things that uh, may or may not work. You didn't have time to run a, a six month pilot study to see how it would work. So what have you learned from all of these tries, all of this creativity and innovations? What do you, what would you like to see persist in a, you know, hopefully soon post pandemic world? Uh, Justice Pickering, let's start with you in, in Nevada. The biggest lesson in all of this is that um, I think courts have been very conservative and afraid to try new things and they go at a glacial pace. And what this has taught everybody is you can afford to be wrong. And if you make a, a mistake, you can course correct. But fear of being wrong is not a reason not to act. And that's been so true in Nevada. If we make a mistake, we fix it and we move forward. Um, I think there are so many people who are dedicated to the right thing, to justice, to bringing that for people. Um, and it has been heartening. The pandemic has been awful, but the spirit of cooperation and ingenuity has been really truly heartening. Um, the groups we got together on the mediation, eviction mediation program, same disputes between landlords and tenants that my colleagues have talked about. But those groups, brought it together and did create this. Whether it'll work or not long-term, I don't know, um, but it's a moving, it's an evolving process and everybody's worked together. So I think that's the main thing. The other point for, um, I think the courts didn't realize the extent to which electronic filing, and you'll be discussing this later today, is hard for people of limited means. They don't have the same internet abilities. so. Blue Jeans or Zoom, um, people don't have, and in rural Nevada, there are some areas that are not covered by the internet. So people just simply don't have internet coverage unless they have satellite internet. So it's a matter of coming of age technologically. But I think going forward, a lot can be done remotely that we would never have thought possible. And I think how much we keep of that going forward, I don't know. Thanks. Chief Justice Hack, what, what do you see or what do you hope to see uh continue uh, in 2022 or whenever we, we get out of this uh, pandemic? Well, I think it's easy to say the remote technology, remote hearings, um, because um, uh, it's, it's just so natural, it's efficient, uh, it saves people uh, a lot of time. Um, one thing we've learned, Ron, I think, and I agree with Justice McCormick, uh, who said this so many times, the courts are 100 years behind. We just really are. I mean, we've got a, a we've got a fast food Amazon online order society, and we're doing business the same way we did in the uh, 50s and 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, so this is going to give us a, a chance to look at things. I'll give you one example. Uh, Texas tried 9,000 cases to a verdict in 2019. About 2,800 of those were in Class C misdemeanors, which or one or two day trials at the most. Uh, there's very, the penalty is not great. The punishment is not a lot at stake. They're not hard to try, 2,800 of them. And now we've shown we can try those cases virtually. Uh, the jurors like it, the judges like it, the lawyers are okay with it. The same lawyers who would never try a murder case virtually are saying, well, we can try these cases. So anything that we can do along those lines to make ourselves more efficient and more, um, I like to say, consumer oriented. Um, uh, I, I think will uh, I think it'll stick and it encourages to do more. Chief Justice Cantil Sakui, what what's what's your vision of a better future? 
I agree with all of what my colleagues have said thus far. I think we need to take the best of what we've learned. And I know that the technology approach, in my experience, has been generational. So at uh, the Supreme Court, where we hear oral argument, many of the attorneys are older and they were hesitant. And now they're just fine and comfortable with blue jeans and oral presentations. So I'm be beginning to think that at least attorney, attorney, judge, proceedings can all proceed remotely, but that we are going to have to have the flexibility in, in person in some matters, dependency and in uh, some criminal trials to, to try remote practices or some portions of it remotely. I also tend to think that now more than ever, interestingly enough, the governor and the legislature really understand even better the value of the judiciary because they're being sued for numerous acts that are all coming to the Supreme Court and the courts of appeal. And they begin to see now uh, the role we play in either uh, denying review or ordering an OSC to a lower court and not taking it ourselves. They're beginning to see how co-equal the third branch really is. Well, here's to education wherever we can find it. Uh, Chief Chief Justice McCormick, last word uh, on uh, lessons learned. Well, I think all of my colleagues did a wonderful job and I agree with everything they've said. Um, you know, courts um, are a service, not a place to quote our friend, uh, Richard Susskind. And uh, it's about time we figure out how to make sure we um, uh, meet that challenge that we, that we have to be a service. The 18th century structures and the 19th century processes are no match for our 21st century problems. And the eight out of 10 people in our country who face those problems and can't afford lawyers and have to navigate those without the help of lawyers. Um, it, it's striking how much we have learned. I, 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 don't, I don't know enough about other states, but in Michigan, we're having um, pro se litigants show up more frequently in Zoom, uh, in Zoom courtrooms. And I know that's true in Texas as well. And I know it's true in Arizona. I don't know enough about the other states, I apologize. But, but we're seeing um, an increase in, um, in people showing up. And when people show up, they get better results, right? Because if you don't show up, you get defaulted. I think that's how it works. Um, so that's pretty striking. Um, that's, so the lessons we have learned just from um, you know, building the plane mid-flight, from doing what we had to do in, emergency, in an emergency, makes me really excited about what we might be able to accomplish if we're doing it intentionally, not in the context of an emergency, with a real focus on um, what we can really get done. We have a lot of lawyers and judges and people in our communities who really care about the significant access to justice gap that we have faced for a generation, two generations. Um, Ron, you know better than I do, for, for as long as my career, as long as I've been active. And we now have this disruptive opportunity where we can um, really keep our feet on the gas and make substantial change um, root and branch to how we do things. Remote proceedings is really important because seeing courts as a service and not a place has to be part of, what, of, of how we rethink what we do. It's not enough. Um, we have to think about um, regulatory reform. We all have to be talking about it. We all have to be, um, and, and those of us who are in leadership positions have to be talking about it. Lawyers are not enough. Um, and process simplification has to be part of the deal. People have to be able to have options to resolve disputes um, that, that, it, that are easier and um, in plain English and, um, and anybody can do it and, and feel good about it. There's, I, I'm mostly excited, as you, might, as you might have noticed. Thank you. And I thank you to all four of our uh, justices. Uh, the title of this uh, panel was uh, The COVID-19 Health Crisis's Effect on the State Courts. If there was ever a topic that left you thinking, boy, this is going to be a downer, this was it. But instead, the leadership, the uh, dedication, the passion, and the creativity that we've heard for the last hour, I find inspiring and contagious. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for all of your leadership. And uh, we look forward to continuing our conversation with you as we go forward.